you know, do you think luck, if you will, plays in the entrepreneurial success of anybody? In other words, obviously there's got to be some fundamental uh, characteristics or intelligence or so on, but what role does luck play in all that? Certainly luck plays a, a role. Mm -hmm. Napoleon once was, was looking at a list of officers he, to consider promoting, and one guy had all this wonderful stars by his name and reports and everything, but Napoleon said, but he isn't lucky. <laughs> you know? and, and that just some people are, I, I don't wanna, so obviously I've had tremendous luck on so many different levels, but it, there is a, an ability one looks for, I think, in, in, to roll with the punches. And so I'm kind of in the business of backing young entrepreneurs now. And it, a lot of it, character has what I look for. There's you know, teamwork and ability to lead a small team and character. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things in there besides luck. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like in a sense people you know, will make their luck to a large degree as compared to it just kind of falls upon them? Well, I think there's both kinds of luck in the world. Yeah. And I've had a lot of luck fall upon me and I've also made some of my luck. And uh, I think that in general, people certainly should never understand that they can't make their own luck. It's, it's odd how many people I talk to who have been super successful entrepreneurs in one way or another, mm -hmm. so many of them started with absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing, no connections, no, no, they just had some simple idea and they took it and they, they just thought well and clearly and they hammered it all the way to heaven, as yeah. Buffett would say. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing how uh, many people make, do make their own luck. So you mentioned Warren Buffett is your rabbi. Yeah. What other people had influence on you, a positive influence on you in helping shape your, your life? I'd say Thomas Sowell, mm -hmm. a writer who's out of Hoover, mm -hmm. had a huge, uh, his writings had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. And also great teachers I had at Dartmouth. David Lubon and Judy Lichtenberg, who are ethicists and, and philosophers, mm -hmm. and also a great Chinese teacher named Liu Huayan Maori. And having a professor who sort of takes you under their wing, and it makes such a difference in a, in a college student's career. And I, I just had this very special relationship with these, these professors. So they're, they're real intellectuals that affected my life. You know, it's interesting because you, you sort of mentioned this, but I, I found that many of the entrepreneurs that we had interviewed almost all of them can point to some you know, pivotal experience or inflection point where they met a certain person who said a certain thing, like you talked about the Indian man who told you a story that impacted you. And it seems to be a, a, a consistent theme uh, that there was some point where somebody said something or they learned something from somebody that took them into a direction and started to shape and define who they are. It's funny. That, well, that's where the other half of that Indian story was going. Mm -hmm. He was an old man by the time I met him, and he had uh, an orphanage school running for in Calcutta for 600 kids. And he had reached this point where he said that there was much more demand for the school than there was place in the school. And there was not, it wasn't an orphanage. They could not stay overnight there. So they were these slum kids who came in, you know, for each day for education. And there were many more applications than there were open spots, including middle class and even wealthy kids it's be, it, who were getting smudged up and sent down and because they were teaching in English. And it's very hard at the time to find a school in India who would teach your kids in English, and they had permission to do so. So the, he asked me this question, and I was on my way off to Cambridge on my Marshall Fellowship. He asked me this question, how do I think about who's really the most deprived, the most worst off kid? And so that got me thinking about the, and reading about the study of the measurement of poverty. So you originally asked, how do these fields of philosophy and economics intersect? That's really where it intersected for me. He got me thinking about the measurement of poverty, which got me thinking more and more about, you know, how do you fix poverty and things like that. And now, I guess, kind of looking into the future, you are... Uh, or Overstock.com is the first online retailer ever to accept Bitcoin as currency, and you are investing heavy in blockchain. So yes. as we talk about poverty, the world, currency, economics, what is it that's got you? It seems like you're going kind of all in on this thing. I am going. <laughs> I am going all in. Uh, it's the most blockchain is the most exciting innovation. It's kind of funny. Ironically, it ties back to 
I told you that I did a degree in math, a master's in mathematical logic is how I started off at Stanford. That while I was doing that, I studied the mathematics of cryptography. Mm -hmm. So when Bitcoin came along in 2008, I guess in the fall, once I understood it was based on cryptography, it was based on all that stuff I used to study that 30 years earlier. It was really kind of funny for me. What I'm so attracted to, given my history, I became convinced that, well, the great flaw of liberal institutions, liberalism in the correct sense, mm -hmm. like what we have as Americans, the Constitution as such, philosophical liberalism, is their great flaw is that they, the institutions themselves get corrupted. Mm -hmm. And Madison knew that. And in uh, Federalist Number 10, he described how we, we built, we studied all the previous attempts at democracy to see what made them fail, and we built this Constitution to prevent that. Unfortunately, the thing that made previous democracies fail more than any other, we haven't found a way to fix. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem of what they called factions or what we, what we call special interests mm -hmm. or capture, capture right, that the government gets captured by interests. And what's, what's beautiful is blockchain lets us recreate all these institutions of society, both private and government, can be recreated in blockchain and there's no way they can be captured. There's no way some lobbyist on K Street can buy, can buy their way out. You know, they, they have shown, the oligarchy has shown that it can buy itself senators and congressmen and some regulators and some law enforcement and so on and so forth, but even they can't buy themselves the laws of mathematics. So as we recreate these social institutions, everything from Visa card to land titling to Airbnb. What's funny is all these, all the, all, the whole economy of sharing mm -hmm. can be disrupted. Mm -hmm. Uber will be disrupted by blockchain. So make, make hay now. Uh, it's, and there's already people working on these ideas. It, you can have a sharing economy without having a centralized corporation keeping the database, i.e. Airbnb when you have a blockchain based identity and such you can reduce it all everything to uh, smart tokens and and algorithms bury okay as opposed to counting on government to stay non-corrupt and businesses to be non-corrupt and to be fair imagine if the functions that they do can be turned into smart contracts and things that can't be cheated and protected cryptographically so there's all kinds of cheating. Not only does all kinds of cheating disappear, I believe there's all kinds of mini oligarchies. I was just down in a South American country where there, were, there was a, land, a hillside, as there are in such places, of undocumented people living in favelas or barrios or whatever they call them. Well, on the hillside, there were, on each hillside, there's one guy who's in charge. He's the boss. Mm -hmm. And the way it was explained to me is they're called the piranhas. <laughs> and they extract basically just enough that the people can, can just afford to stay living there. And they live in prison because it would be unsafe for them to live out there. But they're nice prisons where they have, senor, don't worry, they have their own girls and food and, everything, and chefs. And they get to leave whenever they want. Anyway, they're little gangsters is what I'm saying. They're little gangsters. And they run... And each hillside, remember, out of seven and a half billion people on Earth, five billion people live in the world I just described. Mm -hmm. They don't have formal legal rights like you and I do because they don't live under rule of law. They live on some hillside on, in South America. And because of that, there are all kinds of predators who extract from them. We can, and some of those predators are small-scale piranhas living off 500 families on a hillside. Mm -hmm. Some of those predators are governments themselves. Mm -hmm. So we, and some of them are, are various corporations. I well, I don't want to say predators, but they're simply extracting more than, is, than any fair do would be. They are extractive. It's a basically extractive relationship. Well, guess what? They're now in the buggy whip business because we got blockchain. Yeah.